Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, rival parties agree to postpone Thursday's planned vote on whether to confirm Iwan Gu as the country's next Prime Minister. The vote will now take place on Monday. A local court sentences the former vice president of Korean Air to one year in prison for delaying a plane because she was angry at how nuts were served. Plus, European leaders announced that a ceasefire beginning Sunday has been agreed for eastern Ukraine and that the warring sides have committed to pulling back heavy weaponry from the front line. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Friday, February 13th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. We begin with what was a dramatic day at the National Assembly over the planned confirmation vote on the Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu. After some vocal confrontations, the rival parties agreed to push the vote back until next Monday. Our Park Ji Won starts us off. The country's two main rival parties have agreed to postpone a vote on the confirmation of Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu. After a contentious afternoon, that led them to call off the session until next Monday. Earlier in the day, lawmakers from the main opposition party boycotted parliamentary activities. They were protesting the confirmation of the nominee in committee this Thursday afternoon, with only lawmakers from the ruling Henry Party unilaterally voting to move the vote onto the full assembly. Earlier in the morning, the ruling Senate Party had urged the opposition party to cooperate and allow the vote to proceed as scheduled in order to avoid a vacuum in state affairs. Even long before I was elected floor leader, when the nominee was still the floor leader of the party, both parties had agreed that the full assembly would vote on the nominee following the two-day confirmation hearing. However, the main opposition party said it hoped to delay the vote to sometime later this month, given the various allegations surrounding the nominee's past. Since I have worked with the nominee who was my previous counterpart on many issues at the assembly, I really wanted him to come through the confirmation hearing well. Unfortunately and very regrettably, he has fallen short of people's expectations. The ruling Henry Party holds a majority in the assembly, and if it wanted to, it could go ahead with the vote on its own. However, experts say it's not likely, as the presidential office has already been criticized for its lack of compromise and communication, especially with personnel matters. The burden of pushing through the confirmation might be too heavy for the administration and potentially cripple future assembly sessions. Park Ji Won, Arirang News. The postponement of the vote on the Prime Minister nominee means President Park will have to wait until next week, until she carries out her planned cabinet reshuffle. For more on what we can expect, our Choi Yusan reports. On Thursday, the spokesperson at the presidential office of Cheongwadae said President Park stands by the principle of carrying out the reshuffles after the Prime Minister nominee is approved and recommends her cabinet. The National Assembly Speaker has said the Parliament will vote on Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu on Monday, with or without the opposition party present. That means the President's shakeups are likely to occur the same day or the next. With her economic revitalization plan and reform drive in need of a boost and her approval ratings hitting an all-time low, the President is expected to waste no time appointing people to get state business on track. Reports of Korean ambassador to China Kwon Young says pending replacement Thursday roused speculation that Kwon, one of President Park's confidants, may be named the new presidential chief of staff. Current chief of staff Kim Gi Chun is widely speculated to step down after completing the reorganization of the presidential office. Two to three cabinet ministers are likely to be replaced. 
A ruling party lawmaker close to the president, Yuki Jun, is the highly anticipated candidate for oceans minister, while the unification and transport ministers are other positions that could also be changed. President Bak, who had named special advisors to bolster communication in running the country, is also set to announce a lineup of her political advisors. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Japanese lawmakers are demanding Prime Minister Shinzo Abe tell them what he is going to say in his statement in August to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Abe has hinted that he only intends to discuss the content with his ministers and close aides. Many are worried the right-wing Japanese leader intends to take out some phrases apologizing for Tokyo's wartime atrocities. Connie Kim has more. A debate is raging in Japan's parliament over a statement to be delivered by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in August to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Last month, Abe indicated he will not use certain terms such as colonial rule and aggression, deep remorse or heartfelt apology which were included in Tokyo's 1995 statement by then Prime Minister Domichi Murayama. The country's main opposition Democratic Party has labeled Abe's remarks intolerable and demanded the content of his statement be shared with and discussed in parliament, not just within the confines of Abe's cabinet. Don't you think it's necessary to discuss the contents of the statement with parliament for the sake of national consent? It's hard to pass a resolution in parliament. We announce a statement under our cabinet. And in a rare move, the new Komeito party, part of Abe's ruling coalition, has voiced its concerns, saying the past statements were announced after consultation with lawmakers. The statement is accepted at home and abroad as the basic position of Japan. It's common sense that a consensus is reached within the coalition parties. Adding to the conflict and confusion, the chairman of Abe's ruling Liberal Democratic Party's general counsel, Toshihiro Nikai, said it's only sensible that the cabinet coordinate the upcoming statement with different parties. The international community has been calling on Japan to address its historic past wrongdoings and issue a sincere apology. And with Japanese lawmakers calling for Abe to strike a forgiving tone, analysts say the Japanese leader is under growing pressure to make a heartfelt apology for Japan's past wrongdoings. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Korea has condemned comments made by a top Japanese diplomat claiming sovereignty over the Korea-controlled Dokdo Island in the East Sea. Seoul's foreign ministry says such claims are an act of historical regression and shows Japan has no repent for its imperialistic past, including its colonization of Korea. This comes after Japanese foreign minister Fumio Keshida said Dokdo is part of Japan's territory, this during a speech in Japanese parliament on Thursday. Now, the Korean ministry warned that Japan should not take actions that counter efforts to bring peace, stability and co-prosperity to Northeast Asia. It added that Seoul will firmly respond to Tokyo's claims over Dokdo, which is Korean territory by history, geography and international law. South Korea's defense budget was the 10th largest in the world last year. It came in at 34.4 billion US dollars, just behind Germany, with roughly 44 billion dollars. This according to a report from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. The United States, as you might expect, topped the list, spending 643 billion dollars, followed by China and Saudi Arabia. North Korea did not make it onto the list, but the institute says Pyongyang has uh, taken great strides in en enhancing its missile program and weapons of mass destruction. It added that as a result of the 2008 global financial crisis, NATO and European countries have significantly reduced their defence spending, while Asian countries are investing more in defence. A Seoul court has sentenced the former vice president of Korean Air to one year in prison for violating aviation safety law by ordering a taxiing plane to return to the gate. 
Jo hyun -ah, the eldest daughter of the airline's chairman, ordered a senior crew member to deplane in New York last December for not serving her nuts, according to the first-class manual. The judge in this case, Oh Sung-woo, said the incident is a case where, quote, human dignity was trampled on. The court said it did take into consideration that Jo was the mother of 20-month-old uh, 20 twins, but stressed that her actions harmed the victims. Jo uh, had pleaded innocent to the charge, arguing the airport runway was not part of the flight path. The court, however, said the air path covers the entire course from departure to arrival, and that includes the runway. Prior to the ruling, Joe had submitted six letters of apology to the judges, appealing for leniency. Prosecutors had initially sought a three-year prison term for Joe earlier this month. A decision on whether to close one of Korea's longest-serving nuclear power reactors has been postponed. Local residents and environmentalists have been calling for the immediate closure of the 32-year-old Walsong-1 reactor, primarily out of safety concerns. Gwon Soa reports. Delayed once again. Despite a marathon meeting on Thursday, the fate of Korea's second oldest nuclear reactor hangs in the balance. Korea's nuclear watchdog needs to decide on whether to restart the Waesong-1 reactor or to shut it down forever. The nuclear plant, one of 23 in the nation, was temporarily shut down for review after it reached its designed lifespan. Last October, the Nuclear Safety Board evaluated the Waesong-1 as safe to go for another 10 years. It's not uncommon practice to extend the life of reactors. The oldest Kodi-1 reactor is already eight years into an extension it received in 2007. Those arguing for an extension not only cite safety, but that it costs less than building a new plant and is less harmful to the environment. But residents of Gyeongju, where the plant is located, and environmentalist groups see the issue differently, claiming the reactor has to be shut down immediately and permanently. The debate has been growing since Korea's state-run nuclear power agency called for an expansion of the Waesong-1 reactor's lifespan in 2009. Demonstrators gathered in front of the Nuclear Commission's headquarters, raising safety concerns which could lead to a disaster like Japan's Fukushima accident. We are worried about nuclear radiation. They say the amount is less than what comes from taking an X-ray, but we don't take X-rays 365 days a year. We do breathe in the air every day. With even experts divided on the issue, more deliberation on the matter seems unavoidable. And adding extra weight to the Waesong-1 decision is a line of other aging reactors waiting to be judged on their operational lifespans. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, businesses around the world have a newly found interest in Cuba after the U.S. government recently announced it was lifting its decades-old embargo on Havana. Seoul is pushing local exporters to take advantage of the opportunity to trade with Cuban entrepreneurs and the Cuban government without restrictions or crippling regulations. Song Jison reports. From accessories and telecom devices to electronics and autos, those are some of the items Korean exporters could soon be sending over to Cuba, a market that is soon to be given a strong boost after the U.S. announced its plan to lift its decades-old embargo. An estimate by the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency suggests that foreign direct investment to Cuba will jump 17 times from the current $1 billion to $17 billion when the U.S. sanctions are completely removed. Seoul's outbound shipments to Havana stood at $56 million last year, while imports stood at $12 million. Kutra says Korean companies could use the Cuban market as a bridge to enter Central and South America, but cautions they should also be aware of the rigid government regulations there, as well as the lack of liquidity among prospective partner companies in the island nation. To hedge against the risks, Seoul is taking practical steps to help exporters explore the new business opportunities. 
The Korea Trade Insurance Corporation on Monday signed an MOU with Cuba Central Bank to provide $70 million in trade insurance to Korean companies seeking to export their products. In its bid to re-establish diplomatic ties with Cuba after more than five decades, Seoul is also offering humanitarian aid to Havana, engaging in a development program for the country for the first time. Earlier this week, Seoul's foreign ministry signed an MOU with the UN World Food Program for a $3 million project aimed at improving food production output and reducing poverty in Cuba by 2017. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Global credit rating agency Moody's says lower oil prices won't give any significant boost for the majority of the world's countries. It says the effects of falling oil prices will be offset by the slumping eurozone economies and a slowdown in China, Japan and Russia. Moody's did say, however, that lower oil prices coupled with a uh, favorable economic environment would benefit the U.S. economy and thereby encourage consumer and corporate spending there. Time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following on this uh, Friday morning from Seoul. For that, as always, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by for us at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And happy Friday to you, Mark. Now, more than 16 hours of overnight talks among the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, Germany and France has produced a plan to reinstate peace in eastern Ukraine. Let's first take a listen to what some of the leaders had to say moments after the summit's conclusion. I can say that everything was difficult and in fact various unacceptable conditions were put to us, conditions of retreat, of surrender. It wasn't the very best night of my life, but the morning in my view was kind, because despite all of the difficulties in the process, we managed to agree on the main issues. We agreed on a comprehensive implementation of Minsk, but concrete steps must, of course, be taken, and big hurdles still lie ahead of us. Chancellor Merkel called the agreement a glimmer of hope, no more, no less. The details will now need to be hammered out by lower level officials, but a ceasefire is said to be implemented starting at midnight into Sunday. Leaders also agreed to withdraw heavy weapons from the front lines, rebels to the line set by the September Minsk agreement, and Kiev to the current line, creating a buffer zone of 50 kilometers. The plan also agreed to grant a measure of autonomy to rebel-held territories in eastern Ukraine, guaranteed by constitutional reform by the end of this year. Chancellor Merkel and French President Francois Hollande were en route to Brussels after this summit, where they will attend an EU summit. In Nigeria, a suspected female suicide bomber blew herself up in Borno State, killing at least six people nearby. It happened in a market in the town of Bu in the northeastern state that has become the heartland of the Islamist group Boko Haram. Eyewitnesses said the woman wearing a hijab came into the central market around 3.30 p.m. local time and did not appear suspicious. A nurse at the town's general hospital said three of the six bodies brought in were burnt beyond recognition. Seventeen others were wounded. A community leader said two other women suspected to be suicide bombers as well were arrested at the scene. An Egyptian court has said the two remaining Al Jazeera journalists under detention for allegedly supporting the Muslim Brotherhood should be freed after posting bail. Relatives were visibly taken with joy when they heard the announcement in the Cairo courtroom. The development for Egyptian-born Canadian Mohamed Fahmy and Bahar Mohamed came less than two weeks after their Australian colleague Peter Greste was deported. But the court said it would would move ahead with a retrial of the two remaining journalists with the next session set for February 23rd. The high-profile case that has attracted wide criticism from human rights groups and journalists alike appear to continue. 
The European Central Bank has raised its emergency liquidity assistance to banks in debt strapped Greece, according to sources in the industry. Reports say the ceiling was raised by 5 billion euros, or about 5.7 billion US dollars, to 65 billion euros. Now, this development came as anti austerity Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras took his new government's debt and reform plan to an EU summit in Brussels. Last week, the central bank announced it would no longer accept Greek sovereign bonds as collateral for future loans. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with manager Uli Stilike, who continues to surprise everyone with his style of managing, as it was confirmed that he'll attend the KD Classics opening day. Now, with the 61-year-old set to return to Korea either on March 5th or 6th after his three-week vacation, he's set to come back in time to catch the opening day match between the Chumbu Kendi Motors and Songnam FC on March 7th. Now, though it doesn't seem like it's something out of the norm, he will still become the first foreign manager to attend a K-League opener as he continues to seek the domestic talent instead of sticking with just the overseas players. And during the match, he's set to watch 36-year-old Lee dong who missed out on the Asian Cup due to an injury and look for a possible replacement for Cha Duri, who retired from the national team. Meanwhile, the national team who finished runner-up in the Asian Cup jumped up 15 spots in the latest FIFA rankings and is now ranked 54th in the world. And speaking of domestic talents, figure skating fans in Korea had their eyes on the Korean figure skaters on the first day of the Four Continents Figure Skating Championships, which kicked off on Thursday at the Mokdong Ice Rink. And on the first day, the Pierce Shore program took place with Megan Dumil and Eric Radford of Canada taking the early lead with 75.67 points with Peng Cheng and Zhang Hao of China in second with 69.81 points. Meanwhile, for Rebecca Kim, who was born in Korea but raised in Lithuania, paired with Carol Minoff to represent Korea but finished in ninth place with 46.54 points. And staying on ice with the ISU World Singles Distance Speed Skating Championships taking place this weekend. The focus is on Yi Sang Hwa and whether or not she'll be able to win her third straight gold medal in the event. Now, with the Olympic gold medalist nearly ending her medal streak last weekend, her knee is a huge concern going into the World Single Distance Speed Skating Championships in the Netherlands. But expectations remain high as a third straight gold medal in the 500 meter event will make her the first Asian speed skater to achieve the feat. Iwa Motebam also seeks his third straight gold medal in the 500 meter event, with Lee Sung Hoon competing in five long distance races this weekend. Now, for golf fans here in the nation, the 2015 LPGA season has so far been an exciting one, with the Koreans winning the first two events of the season. But the question is will they be able to break the single season win record? Now, the current record for the most wins in a single season dates back to 2006 and 2009, where the Koreans combined for 11 victories. But after Chen Ayana and super rookie Kim Se Young notched the first two victories of the season, they're definitely on pace to break that record. Now, the record doesn't include players like Michelle Wee nor Lydia Ko and just the players who hold Korean citizenship. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, we are waking up to quite cold morning today. The sensory temperatures will be hovering minus 10 degrees throughout the morning uh, for the upper provinces. So be sure to dress extra warmly before heading out today. And the afternoon highs will be as chilly as yesterday. Uh, but yesterday's winds pushed away all the lingering dust, so the air got much cleaner. And the skies will be clear under mostly sunny skies. But dry weather continues continues today across the nation with dry weather watch in effect for most part of the eastern uh, region. So keep that in mind and let's take a closer look at the readings for today. So the low in Seoul kicked off at minus 6 and the high will climb up to 3 while the top temperatures in Daegu and Gwangju will rise to 6 and Busan will top out at 7 this afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon should see a high of 8 and 4 and Dokdo only 
mixed to freezing mark. That's all for Korea, and here's international weather for beers around the world. Well, that's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour. Have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.